whose central theme uh, is that of thinking, mind, and creativity, three concepts, as you know, that have uh, always been fundamental. The tendency today, however, is to consider a thought as much less important than action, of such a little importance, in fact, uh, that we are increasingly delegating it to the machine. This mm -hmm. idea of letting machines think for us, uh, besides confirming a simplistic and reductionistic view of mind itself, uh, reinforces the paradigm of our hyper-technological civilization, which runs the risk of uh, treating uh, social system as mechanism and reducing politics to technocracy. Without the human thought, how can we light up our minds or candle our capacity for creativity? Another critical point regards the logics of separation and closure that characterize our educational and training institution. As I have been saying for years, uh, unfortunately, our educational and training institutions promote, in theory, multi inter transdisciplinarity and a complexity approach and vision. But in reality, as you know, they are hindered by rigid separations between disciplinary sectors. The problem, as you know, is not the specialization of knowledge. The problem is that we have created the conditions for knowledge and skills not to dialogue. And I think that it's a long and complex road. It will be interesting to hear what our speakers today will have to say on this subject, which is sure to be, above all, thought provoking. So I'm very happy to uh, have with us here today, Ulrika Sejus Rail from uh, the Illinois Institute of Technology and fellow of the WAAS, Rodolfo Fiorini, Emeritus Professor from the Polytechnic University of Milan and WAAS, Thomas Reuter from the University of Melbourne and the International Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Sciences, and Carlos Alvarez Pereira from the Club of Rome and fellow WAAS. The audience can find more information and links about each of them in the Word document that you will see in the chat. I am going to ask you to answer three questions. Uh, which participant and audience can see in the chat. You can answer them in any order and of course, and add any points you may feel are relevant. Each of you will have 10 minutes and I'd like to, inv to invite the audience to feel free to write comments, links or questions in the chat. We'll follow the order uh, that the candidates are listed in the program uh, so uh, I'd like to begin with uh, Ulrika, and then now I uh, try to read the, the question for you. Huh? The question for discussion about thinking are as follows. Uh, question number one, in what sense uh, is the way we are thinking now and the way we are educating youth to think today part of the problem? And how does the manifest in the way and the type of knowledge generation knowledge and dissemination and the social impact and consequences on knowledge in life? This question directly links the way we think to education and the challenge of human security and sustainability. So question number two, what uh, change in thinking and education would we need to inculcate to overcome the limitation and uh, deficiencies of our present mode of functioning? And the third question is the work of the academy has been emphasizing the need for a shift to a concept of reliable knowledge with its context sensitive, comprehensive, organic, integrated, value based, cognizant of both objective and subject dimension of reality. How will educational content and pedagogy need to change in order to guide? and encourage a way of thinking needed that we do or than we have in the past. Thank you very much. And please, Ulrika, we are hearing you. I read your questions. 
Uh, and uh, I also read uh, several papers referred to, uh, and I found it a very nice reading. I think I have wonderful colleagues. Uh, uh, Thomas, uh, two papers, recent papers, Gary and others, uh, this whole lead in uh, to the newest uh, Cadmus issue. Uh, it was really great. And so I have a, I think I have a relatively clear feeling about what it is about, but it is very complicated. And my first reaction, if I may be quite honest, is that it is not a matter of thinking. Uh, of course, we should think, uh, we should not think wrong, uh, screw up stuff and so on. And we should not let uh, uh, thinking go to the machines. Very good point, Piero. But I think that it is, um, uh, if we talk about creativity, it is very much a matter of condition on creating the right conditions for creative, for creativity or identifying them and then trying to produce them so that people in those conditions uh, will be stimulated to bring out their best creativity, uh, the best of themselves. And of course, this is hard to, uh, to specify, but we have examples of uh, such conditions. And um, uh, because I'm not a philosopher and I don't go around brooding about various ways of thinking, uh, although I am fascinated by the idea that we can transcend our present limitations and get to some higher level of thinking through evolution or through something, uh, that is really interesting on the horizon. But that's not where I am at all. I am actually, uh, uh, I am actually uh, uh, both a researcher and uh, a teacher. Uh, and um, the more I teach, the more kind of insights I get I guess, into something, which is uh, uh, what students are about. Of course, I am in America, I'm in Chicago, I'm teaching international students, so it is not a necessarily very typical case either. Uh, I'm not out there in a small school, in a village, for instance, that would be very interesting. Um, but um, so I am reflecting generally on creativity. I'm going to address this issue totally in my own way. Okay, so. Uh, so I think it has to do with establishing the right conditions. And I think this is something that teachers, educators do intuitively. Uh, there is a kind of feeling about under what conditions students actually would do their best. Uh, well, uh, during a, a long career of, of, of experimenting or, or like perceiving things, uh, I think it very much has to do with uh, them feeling that they can cont contribute something that their opinion is asked for. Uh, uh, they have to get engaged and their emotions uh, uh, kind of stimulated. And uh, if they are engaged, they actually will learn. Uh, everybody knows, and as you have so eloquently described in your papers, everybody knows that the, the time is over when we are supposed to sit and soak up stuff. But I think that the idea of uh, I think the idea of this universal education that you just uh, tap uh, from the internet and then kind of soak up is not, not a very realistic one because there has, it is not necessarily so that students are motivated to learn by, uh, by, by listening. Even if it is very student-centered and they can do it on their own time, I find that they don't read what I assign uh, uh, in that way. So it's not a necessarily a, a, a there has to be a physical expectation somewhere that they are doing their thing and there has to be a relationship involved. And that is why we have to have this uh, mixed uh, uh, project uh, of uh, learning, which so many of you have also suggested. Okay, so I think, what, why do I say uh, that uh, uh, there are conditions? Because I have been studying scientists. I have written a biography actually uh, 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 of a, very eminent scientist who has described his own process of thinking very often and his creative process. And I have then, in addition, analyzed his life based on more information. And, uh, uh, and I think he, ha he has indirectly uh, mentioned both the conditions for why he is so creative. Of course, he had also a very big head, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It may be a particular case, but uh, uh, if I look at this, this case and also other cases of uh, supposed uh, uh, 
great creativity of scientists. It has to do with having a concrete problem situation, which is extremely hard. It is so hard that they are frustrated to death and they don't want to see it any longer. So after working on it for a very long time and with their best capability, and they are all intelligent people, they get very angry and they go out for a walk or something like that, or go to the beach and just sit there and you know, soak up the sun. And then suddenly, as Sidney Brenner did, uh, who was a discovery of the uh, RNA uh, situation after the, uh, after the DNA synthesis, he jumped up from the beach and said, it's the magnesium, stupid, okay? <laughs> they had put too little magnesium and therefore they didn't see the effects that they expected because they were sure that their experiment, their experimental model was right, but there was something wrong. And even if it showed negative results for a very long time, they didn't give up, which is another marvelous uh, uh, feature in scientists. They just don't give up and that neither should we. Okay, so uh, the point is that the problem focuses somehow the mind. And even if you don't know what's going on, the creativity happens there somewhere and bingo, you get it. This is of course a very stereotypical view, but I think that there is something to the expectations of others who know that you are working on the problem, maybe your support group, and the, and, uh, 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 and the point that you have done your utmost best activated as much as you can of your brain. And then when it is at rest, something happens. And what is it that happens? It seems to be in creativity, one of the aspects is some kind of connection between different neural circuits. I mean, I'm speaking now in layman's terms, but something like this. And uh, as uh, Yanani explains in one of her papers, uh, uh, she talks about symbols and metaphors, exactly. There is uh, various ways in which totally unrelated networks can kind of connect because of some similarity of some kind that the brain perceives, or you may not even see it yourself, but sometimes you do. For instance, my, uh, uh, my um, uh, uh, the person I studied, was actually describing that he got one of his best ideas for modeling uh, parasite prey, uh, uh, prey interaction. He was into this kind of various kinds of uh, biological modeling. He got one of his best ideas from a novel of, by, by Tolstoy, where, where characters were kind of having seething disagreements. Okay, so you know you take it from one part of the brain and it connects with the other part and so on. Therefore, what we should do and what we know we have to be doing anyway, is to expose, try to uh, uh, interest, make students interested in expose students to all kinds of different uh, 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 realms of learning, art, uh, uh, engagement, emotional engagement, and so on at an early point, so that they get this kind of uh, tools sitting there that then kind of activate later. This is like that. and the, connect somewhere. I find it totally fascinating. And I, I think uh, more of this, of course, will be, will be found out. So uh, another, another uh, uh, kind of simulation of this situation, which I think will stimulate creativity, is, uh, of course, project-based learning. Project is a kind of simulated real situation where you have a problem to solve. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, as Yanani was also saying in her paper, uh, uh, humankind has been in, in these situations to solve problems, of course, throughout our uh, existence. It has ne not ne always been as urgent as some of these scientific problems, but it has been something that had to be solved. And therefore, all the capabilities and perceptions were kind of mobilized, maybe out without our knowledge, in order to find out for instance, agriculture had to be discovered because the wild animals could not be chased any longer, and it you had you had to do you, you had to to become stationary. So what do you do now? So there is a kind of that has been a slower process. But project-based learning is one simulation, and also as uh, you have I think two different slightly competing models about what to do at this world level. One is some kind of edu uh, basic edu uh, educational um, model, which is of course very valuable, uh, 
and uh, then there is, but it has to be complemented with others. And then you have another uh, suggestion, which is um, that um, uh, it's very important to involve children at an early stage in various kinds of activities, uh, which uh, provide some kind of entrepreneurship or some kind of internship or activities so that you get, get skills early on. And I think they also contribute to that, to those networks that, uh, and help you uh, bro if further broaden your, um, your uh, uh, so to say, tool bag for creativity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Liga. Uh, very uh, stimulating and interesting uh, speech, uh, as always, as always. And now is the time of uh, uh, professor and friends. Uh, Rodolfo Fiorini, uh, Emeritus Professor of Polytechnic of Milan. Please, Rodolfo. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Your questions are quite interesting and, uh, and uh, I approach them uh, taking in co into consideration my recent past experience that uh, uh, the World Academy created the STEAM working group to develop a new model for scientific learning leadership and uh, collective competitive collaboration. The STEAM working group is addressing current approaches to science, engineering, technology, and mathematics applications in education, which are still based on a model to Newtonian, Newtonian reductionist thinking, um, which leaves uh, uh, little scope or emphasis to on development of creativity and imagination needed to evolve appropriate solutions to the toughest problems related to current uh, and future social impact and human well-being. Uh, but we have to remember that uh, we are uh, humans. We are and uh, living organisms are a constant combining of multiple forms of communication and interaction between organisms warm data. While, while it may be possible to capture and some of them by first order approximation and transmit them to future generation by education, the second and higher order of combination and communication remain unseen, inseparable, undefinable, and crucial to the trajectories, well-being, and aesthetics of ongoing inclusive vitality. We need to capture the second and higher orders of social combination and communication by regenerative co-evolving learning. The usual approach is the, just the, the, the one we are using now, you know, with uh, conference after conference, uh, refining, uh, uh, you know, further approximations. Uh, for, for understanding better, uh, better and better. But uh, while it may be possible to capture some of them by first, first order approximation and transmit them to future generation by education, uh, the second and higher orders of combination are much, much uh, tougher to transmit. We need to capture the second and higher orders of social combination communication uh, by regenerative co-evolving learning. What does it mean? This requires the inclusion of arts and STEM and in a, a arts in, a, in, a, in, their, in their vast meaning and commitment from each uh, uh, of us to step beyond our learner specialization and open up a channel to a world that can hold space for paradoxes and contradictions as equally valid perspectives to empower a world based on reconciliation rather than compromises. Compromises, uh, uh, current compromises with knowledge coming from anybody and the key players of heterogeneous realities. Then we will start understanding the value of our biodiversity in the universe which we, immerse, we are immersed within and we uh, are a part of it. And so we can only try to capture them by, uh, uh, I said, the regenerative co-evolving learning. I give you immediately an example. For instance, in infancy, 
We need tools that have the goal of making, of making abstract abstractions visible to bring theory into the brain through the senses as early as possible. And this requires the inclusion of arts in STEM and the commitment for each, each of us to step beyond our learner specialization and open up a channel to a world that they can hold the space for paradoxes and contradictions. I think that, that that's the way. So the uh, World Academy and the uh, World Academy STEAM Working Group will evolve symbiotic creative experiential approaches to address the critical need for changes in the way we think, prepare youth, and apply an integration of art, science, technology, and math to meet social needs. It will engage the World Academy and other organizations to achieve a more integrated form of thinking with regard to the social application and consequences of STEAM on society. Its impact will create bold disruption that yields solutions to the toughest problem of human security, welfare, and well-being. Will being. I give you a further example uh, of a new way of thinking. You know that uh, uh, is uh, is from uh, uh, quantum mechanics in the sense that uh, we are we were educated by Newtonian mechanics, and so I give you this simple example to take uh, your your thumb finger of the, the right hand thumb finger and the ring uh, finger and try to, to, uh, to touch them and looking at them. And so you immediately see when, we, when they touch, okay? Now try to do the same operation without, without seeing and you have the feedback by your same, other senses. And when you feel touching them, then you turn your head that and try to look at them. And then you discover that they don't touch it yet. Hmm. This is something to think about. Second example. Uh, we usually mirror our images, images on a mirror, on the usual mirror, without the real, I mean, and, and take it for a usual to see our reverse image. That's not, not usual because uh, I think uh, uh, it's not usual at all. It means that uh, we are looking at a representation of ourselves that is reversed. So our representations of the world are reversing the reality. Think about that, so simple and so deep. Okay, and so we need to reimagine uh, an education framework embedded in co-evolutionary -evolution, th living in the present, such that our current actions regenerate value into the future, from infancy to lifelong learning. Finally, Let's remember that there is no real enthusiasm if it's not contagious and affects other people like us. So please share with me this enthusiasm. That uh, the uh, recent uh, neuroscience, neuroscientific uh, uh, findings uh, uh, just uh, are saying that uh, uh, our creativity is based on three basic operators. That is blending, breaking, and blending. Bending, breaking, and blending. And, and, and those are not just words, but uh, uh, finding from uh, uh, sp specific experiments on, on uh, organisms. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Rodolfo, uh, now it's uh, the turn of uh, Thomas uh, Reuter, uh, who uh, I'm sure uh, who will be able uh, to further enrich in terms of approach uh, this panel uh, that is uh, in its panelists and their background is uh, multidisciplinary. In the, in this is a, a, a great challenge for, for us. Uh, 
Please, Thomas. Thank you, Piero. Uh, well, my perspective is that uh, I'm, I'm a professor of anthropology and uh, I'm an Asia expert, just to give you an idea of what my background is. So I also studied psychology and you know various other social sciences. Anyway, uh, on the first question, uh, in what sense uh, the way we're thinking now and the way we're educating youth uh, may be part of the problem. I wanted to say that in my view, and having had three children uh, go through the education system of different countries at different times, um, that education today is still very much a product of modernist uh, mindsets. And much like prisons, schools are disciplinary institutions in keeping with Michel's Foucault's masterful characterization thereof. And the disciplinary measures are basically forms of mental punishment and the methods used today are negative assessment um, and expulsion in the extreme. And on the other hand, the carrot is sort of the, the promise of a high income job. That's, that's basically how it's, it works. And I feel that the joy of learning, exploration and discovery are not as central as they should be and must be. I think it's unlikely that such a disciplinary authorian, authoritarian system will be able to encourage our new generation to come up with creative ways to transform society. And if they do, I think it will be not because of their education, but rather despite of it. <laughs> Certainly that's my own personal ex experience of it too. And by and large, the other problem is that today's education system reproduce power relations in society. And you know, the, the evidence says that social mobility has trended downwards, at least in the West from the eighties onward. And education has lost much of its em emancipatory promise. For example, mm -hmm. the, the private school system in English speaking countries uh, show such a reproduction of power through education for the privileged only or good education for the privileged in the extreme. There and almost everywhere else also political education is woefully inadequate. And as a side effect, whatever knowledge of science students may acquire can and, and often is later sidelined because they become involved in some kind of identity politics, which overrides their sci scientific thinking. So science education by itself does not make a person rational when it comes to politics. Finally, the liberal scientific worldview that is still propagated in education uh, is also nature destroying, we all know that. So blind faith in technology threatens to repeat the mistakes of the past. The ecological disaster we face today is 100% a result of technological innovations, much lauded as they may be. But they are, and that is because they are created to produce private profit while socializing costs or externalizing them to ecosystems. So we need a new, more critical science, a science that does not wash its hands in presumed innocence. And the changes of thinking, the second questions, I think less hierarchy and more respect for young learners would be really helpful. Young people are, and Rudolfo will probably confirm that for you, are proven to be more intelligent than older people. Their brains are working perfectly well, much better than ours though they may have less knowledge. So why do we treat them in such condescending ways? Especially in the age of internets, where learners, you know, really they have plenty of facts at their hands, but they need to understand principle, principles and learn analytical skills and not memorize things they can Google in seconds. There's still a lot of me mechanical road learning of, of the corpus of knowledge. And that is outdated. It keeps happening in schools, though, even at undergraduate level. Uh, of course, some facts are still worth having at one's fingertips, say, if you're a doctor. Yeah, but we, would, we should be very selective about what factual learning we, we uh, hang on to and, and what we replace with analytical skills. The interpretation of facts is what really matters. We are all bombarded with facts every day, and as well as with fake news, pretend facts. And 
if people are unskilled in verifying facts and in, and in interpretation, they make individual mistakes or they rely on social media for their identity and forming of opinions. And as a result, you get populism. Education, I think, must inoculate learners against that danger. Uh, le learners also lead, need opportunities, I think, to ex work in explorative projects, which would help them develop their creative imagination and also their ability to collaborate in teams. I'm going to talk uh, tomorrow in, in, a, in a paper session on also on the uh, role of imagination and exactly how that's sort of anchored in, in our perception and our, our, the very root of our consciousness. Um, and that's uh, imagination is a mental faculty that's almost missing completely in modernist thought. And most of all, learners need to make, learn to make more value, value judgments. And I don't mean just in the humanities, but also in natural science. They have to think about what technology actually means. So science teachers should be trying to deliver a reflexive element in their teaching, or else we will keep perpetuating, perpetuating the myth that science and technology are value neutral. The science teacher, I think, should not just should, for example, not just speak about nuclear fission uh, as a physics problem and, and ignore the implications from nuclear power plants to atomic bombs. So critical science teaching is, is one practical, vital practical step. And students should walk away thinking that, well, it's great to understand the laws of nature and it opens many technical opportunities, but it's also dangerous much as, you know, in the story of the uh, magician's apprentice. Uh, just an example, I recently wrote a paper about ethics in nanoscience in food. You know, we're eating nanoparticles the whole time, every day. There's too much, too little discussion of ethics in such new fields. And yet this failure, for example, could cause very serious harm. So precautionary harm reduction should be a central part of the design process in technology and also in teaching, teaching uh, to think about the implications of, of, of uh, technology. Finally, on the question of, of educational philosophy uh, of the kind that Vaz has been very uh, uh, consistently advocating for, and I, I just wanted to say that it's not really that new. It's not that far removed, at least in theory, from the humanistic Renaissance idea ideal of education, you know, that's well known from the German idea of Bildungs uh, ideal. So meaning holistic, well-rounded, value sensitive, leading to a civilized and humane attitude. The problem therefore, I think is not that we lack ideas of what education should be, but we don't know how to put that into practice. Personally, I think we should, we need a revolution in teacher training. We may also need some training for university lecturers. Many of them never received any pedagogical training at all. And yet are expected to live lectures at the level of sophistication of say a high quality uh, TED talk with advanced audio visuals and so on. The support is just not there for these educators. High school teachers uh, simply do not have the time to develop sophisticated lesson plans. We could perhaps cut their contact hours in half and double their numbers, but who will pay for it? Are we willing to pay for that? Or we can provide them with advanced curriculum support, which may be more cost effective. And I don't mean textbooks or model worksheets or things like that, but lesson plans with advanced audiovisual content. The teacher would then become more of a moderator and facilitator, someone who accompanies the learner and helps them to process and interpret the content. That's just on a practical level. I'll rest my case there. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Very, very interesting. We have a lot, a lot of things to debate and discuss. Huh? And uh, for example, uh, to discuss about the, the fake news. Fake news uh, are uh, uh, a pathology or a symptom of uh, something more worrying, for example, the decline of democracy. But we have a very little few time, so 
please, Carlo, Carlos Alvarez Pereira, we are uh, hearing you, and I'm sure that uh, your contributions are, as always, uh, interesting and stimulating for us. Please, Carlos. Many thanks, and many thanks to Gary and for inviting me, and congrats to both of you, because most of what I will say is already contained in the framing, the description of this session, which is in the agenda. But I will elaborate a little bit more with your permission uh, in answer to your questions. So how deep is the issue of the way we think? It's quite deep. I mean, if we asked, um, if we had the opportunity to ask Gregory Bateson, he would have said that the main problems in the world come from the difference between how nature works and the way we think. A literal quote, you know? And uh, back, in the, back in the 70s, because all what we are discussing has been already discussed uh, long ago and, uh, and with very creative responses. In 1979, the Club of Rome published a report, which is much less known than the limits to growth, titled No Limits to Learning. The title says it all, right? But the subtitle was addressing the human gap. And the human gap is that you could use this definition by Bateson or you could use the, the perspective of this is the difference between uh, our capacity to act and our capacity to understand the consequences of our actions. And I would add, and the, the, our willingness to deal with the consequences of our actions. So of course, this is very much related to cybernetics, to feedback loops, to communication theory that Rodolfo has mentioned. Where is the, um, I mean, what is the, the background uh, in my view is just that we don't have access to reality. Our conscious mind doesn't have access to reality. We have perceptions. We receive through all our body perceptions of reality that we interpret according to certain frameworks of interpretation, which are usually not explicit, not even necessarily conscious. And those frameworks limit very much how we can interpret. Look at the many interpretations uh, that COVID has brought to us or any other phenomenon. So for me, fake news are just a symptom that we have many different frameworks of interpretation, but most of them are dominated by what Thomas uh, mentioned, you know, the modernist mindsets. And in, in modernity with a capital M, interestingly and strangely enough, uh, some domains of knowledge have been able to uh, change dramatically their frameworks of interpretation, for instance, physics, and Rodolfo wrote a fantastic paper on that, on the many paradigms that physics has been able to produce over time to try to interpret what the, came out from the experiments. But overall in society, in the way we organize society, in the way we organize governments, or uh, politics or economy, uh, we are very much in this paradigm of modernity, which is built on separation as a key concept and separation and disconnection from nature, of course, from other human beings, from separation. I mean, and it's very useful for many things, but it's very dangerous when you apply that to the whole epistemology of our relationship with others, with nature and, and with time. And interestingly enough, modernity, we cannot say that modernity has not been effective. It has been terribly effective. I mean, and of course, um, it has built a, a whole world from that paradigm of, uh, of separation. How could it be, you know? Well, the point is that we have been consistently ignoring um, the, the consequences of our actions I mean, putting them aside, the tensions and tragedies we were creating, we have been ignoring them. Now, time has come in which we cannot ignore them anymore. And because they, you know, they slash back, they come back to us. So that's where the, so for instance, COVID, 
what do you learn from COVID? You could say, oh, uh, our systems are fantastic. Our society is fantastic because we have been able to develop new, new vaccines, right? And that's a blind spot because the new vaccines is a new response of disconnection. What do we have to do now to be human? Separate from others, wear masks, isolate ourselves, uh, social distance and use vaccines. And we don't ask anymore the question of why did the, why did the virus came in the first place? We don't remember about the destruction of ecosystems. But trying to answer um, very briefly to the other two questions, I would say, I think the most important thing we need to do is to change our lens, you know? And the miracle is that we have blind spots, but we are able to realize that we have blind spots, which in my view is quite a miracle, you know? I'm not saying we can identify all our blind spots, but at least we know we have that. And, and then from there, we can go elsewhere and look at how people in typically in uh, desperate situations have been learning uh, because they had no option to learn. If you look at that, if you put the lens off uh, on, let's look at situations where this human gap has been overcome in a deliberate way to produce what Aurelio Peche, the founder of the Club of Rome called the human revolution, to respond to the human gap, he was calling for a human revolution in mindsets. What you find there is a lot of commonalities, a sense of humility, epistemological humility. We don't know how to <laughs> face the, the mess in which we are. Let's recognize that. Let's work on building processes and, and on the quality of how we work, walk together, rather than pretending we have the responses, we have the solutions. Another commonality is liberation from helplessness. Let's stop thinking we have no options other than the options that the system is, is providing, you know? For instance, and the system again is, each time there is a crisis, it provides a new level of disconnection and a new level of technological whatever. You know, well, let's, let's figure out that there are other possibilities. And let's, I like very much the uh, Rodolfo, the bending, breaking, blending. So I would bend our perception, you know, use a new lens, which is in a way bending our perception of reality. I would break the model of knowledge creation we have to put it upside down. I mean, break, don't interpret me wrongly, but I would put actually upside down. We have to start from the questions instead of starting from the institutions, which are just answering questions which are no longer, they might be valid, but are no longer relevant for our humanities challenges. So let's start from the questions and, and from the ground and from people and blending because it is about blending all threads of knowledge, all capacity, all human capacities, conscious and unconscious. Donella Meadows said, dancing with systems. Let's dance with systems. Art and art, not just as decoration, as a fundamental capacity of expression. That has already been done by pedagogic pioneers. I mean, Lev Vygotsky worked one century ago. Uh, Loris Malaguzzi uh, worked 70 years ago, and so on and so on. Kids come with 100 languages, said uh, Malaguzzi. I mean, that's where we have to come back to rehumanize. And you know what? What gives me optimism is that this human revolution is happening is happening in places which are not so visible and maybe that's part of their secret. They don't need to be so visible. We just have to look at them to find the sources of what needs to be done and then try to catalyze the emergence of this human revolution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos. Uh, a lot uh, of uh, stimulating idea and uh, vision, perspectives, time for questions. Uh, ju just a, just a, a little consideration. Um, 
uh, recently, as, as you know, um, speaking of uh, um, future generations, according to the uh, World Economic Forum, 65% uh, of the children currently in elementary school uh, will have uh, uh, jobs uh, in the future, which not only do not yet exist, uh, but uh, which we cannot even imagine, considering how fast work uh, is uh, changing in our world today. And we are in the age of automation, we are in the age of simulation, we are in the age of uh, uh, hyper-technological and hyper-connected civilization that, in my opinion, is based on uh, some uh, great illusion. For example, the illusion of rationality, the illusion of control, of total control, the illusion of uh, predictability that is uh, based on uh, the idea that uh, everything is uh, uh, observable, everything is measurable. Uh, the illusion is uh, predictability uh, determines also our approach in front of uh, the black swans. Uh, the idea, uh, we, we can say we can observe this also in, the, uh, in this pandemic, in this uh, global uh, and systemic emergency. And the emergency is uh, one of the structural characteristics of the complex system. So, uh, one of uh, our challenges is, uh, and I'm very interested to your opinion, to your vision, uh, is uh, to educate, to rethink how we think, to rethink how we think, uh, but also to, to try to educate him to not control, not to total rationality, uh, but to unpredictability. So what, what is your opinion? We know, we know that, uh, that uh, the best itineraries uh, will be those uh, uh, best uh, equipped to prepare uh, people. Uh, I, I like to say uh, inhabit uh, the current and future complexity. I, I propose the idea of uh, hybrid figures that are not, uh, uh, I'd like to, to be clear, experts of everything. Hybrid figures that are prepared um, uh, about an uh, epistemological and methodological level. Um, what is your opinion about this? But, but in my, obsolescence of knowledge and skills. In my opinion, we don't have to uh, rethink the way we think. We have just to use the expression by a friend of mine, Nadia Sandy, uh, let's allow life to be again. It's <laughs> as simple as that. So it's not about a conceptual a conceptualization, a new conceptualization of how we should think. It's about coming back to our natural capacity yeah. mm -hmm. as systems thinkers. Mm -hmm. So we, we might imagine, oh, we need to, 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 we have to teach systems thinking to people. So they have to go to, to universities to get masters in systems thinking. Well, no, I mean, uh, research has shown that kids have natural capacities for systems thinking. The issue is that since education is based on this concept of separation, we have a system which is only able to learn and it learns a lot. It's not that the modern societies are not learning. They are learning a huge amount of things, but all they need to learn in order not to learn the essential, in order not to question the essential uh, assumption of, of separation. So my approach to this would be more an approach of liberation and rehumanization. Uh, Karima Gadawi, the leader of um, the Tamkin Foundation, she works with communities. She started in Tangiers, you know, she says, well, at the beginning, we wrote a 10-page document to explain what we would do. 10 years after, we don't need any more of this document. It has dissolved. Because what, what do we do? Just rehumanize. period. With all means of expression and all capacities, all human capacities, and of course, making uh, creating the conditions for people to liberate themselves from helplessness and to learn by themselves. 
Yeah, if I could just briefly comment, um, uh, that's a great idea, Carlos. Uh, I think you have to kind of rethink humanism, you know, in education. It's such a humanist endeavor and it, uh, it's really quite consistent. But the other thing that's occurred to me is uh, we, we talk so often about the lobbying of the f fossil fuel industry, lobbying of the pharma industry, but there isn't a hell of a lot of lobbying going on about education really, from industry, from corporation, not that much lobbying. I think we might have an opening there if we can actually can translate some of our insights into specific recommendations that we could send simply to education departments around the world. Why don't we consider that as a sort of a, you know, uh, a longer term plan? No, because I think it has to hit the crown somewhere. We have, this is FE5, the fifth future education conferences, and I've tremendously enjoyed all of them. But I'd like to see some kind of policy advice coming out of that, because it's, it's, I think it's pretty open. The field's pretty open for lobbying about education. I think that we need to develop educational ecosystems to inspire st students rather than getting through. And include, include, inclusive thinking, helping the, us to understand who really we are and when we, are, we want to go. And the most uh, crucial use of knowledge and thinking is to understand the importance of developing a good art, going to the core of inner, inner education. For me, that's the, the crucial point. Just remembering we have a, a art to use. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Gary, we have uh, uh, other time, some, some minutes for uh, other comments uh, because are in a perfect uh, time for the, your confusion. I'd like to thank the whole panel for a wonderful experience. This certainly exceeded your eloquence, clarity, insight, exceeded my expectations, and obviously raises much more deeper issues for discussion than we can handle here. But in spite of the fact that we've been pursuing this discussion for five conferences, I would say we've moved somewhere and I feel we're not in the same place we were before. And you're absolutely right, Thomas. The next step for us uh, is how do we operationalize it? I'd just like to make a few concluding remarks. I would not possibly try to summarize. Some of it will, like most of it will reflect what's already been said in different ways. Uh, but I think uh, when, Carlos started out by saying our problem is that our knowledge is based on separation of everything. And this is a characteristic way in which mind tries to know things. We call it reductionism. This is the breaking up. We've got a whole that's too complex. So we break it up into parts and we try to look at each of the parts and deal with it as a separate reality and try to understand it in itself and lose more and more the relationship between the parts. And not satisfied with that, we drill down to the big deeper levels and find out, no, there's a lot more to this and a lot more complexity. And we go to deeper and deeper levels of parts and separation, more and more losing touch with the whole. And of course, uh, as has been said, systems thinking is an attempt to compensate for the breaking by relating together. We've broken up all the parts. Now, how do we put it back together? How do we reassemble uh, Humpty Dumpty? And maybe part of the problem of the session is when we say uh, different ways of thinking, maybe the word should have been different ways of knowing. Because I think the, the dominant reality that we're experiencing today, whether it's with COVID-19 or it's with the pandemic, uh, or it's with the climate change, or it's with the whole global economic social system, the political system is 
the absolute inseparable interrelationship between everything. There's only one reality. We cannot, we've, we've had an economics that ex, uh, pretended that it was separate from the environment uh, for centuries, uh, or it's been separate from the political system, but we know that this is only the mind's way of separating things so that we can look at parts. And the more and more we take those parts for reality, the more and more we lose the power that comes from integration. And so I raised the question, it's too profound. I think these are not the only ways we know or not even the only ways we think. And that great thinking not only is capable of breaking up or connecting together again, or trying to blend and bend, but there, are, there is a thinking that can see the whole and see things in relationship to each other. And that is more typical in the arts where we say a picture is worth a thousand words, <laughs> a thousand words of linear reductionism uh, in one image or even in one humorous statement captures a reality uh, that the other doesn't. So I think the point for us is that the future of our educational system, what could be more important than teaching us about the instrument we're using or the instruments and ways of knowing so we are more and more conscious of both the powers of each, each of them, each of these ways has powers in it and the limitations of them. And I think that's what the founding of the World Academy was all about. We had brilliant, imminent world thinkers, scientific thinkers who came up with, or were at least instrumental in the invention of nuclear weapons to quote, save the free world, not realizing that in the process, they would endanger the entire world and the environment and themselves and that to, for science to think of itself outside of the context of society and the responsibility of our knowledge for its consequences and its applications, this is one of the separations we've had, as if our knowledge is some way uh, independent from the world we live in. So we've had a lot of discussion already in the conference about multidisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity, and then the, the academy, it's a core, uh, theme as it has been for Edgar Morin, uh, but this is only one of the separations. We've, we've, we've arbitrarily cut up reality into so many pieces as if they're separate from each other. And knowing one, you can be an expert and a master. Whereas in fact, without knowing all, you could never arrive at a perfection. Without understanding the relationship of what of each to all. We're not even trying to give that. We're not even trying to give that global, holistic, or integrated perspective. My second comment is about uh, systems thinking has been a great advance for us, and we see the power of it, and we rely, rely on it so much today. But I'm, I'm not convinced that systems thinking is the same as integration. The systems thinking, we're trying to, we've got the parts and now we're trying to connect them together and connect all the lines together. When it comes to the human body, the human body cannot be mapped adequately by drawing out all of the systems. Uh, it's, an, it's a mental abstraction. If you learn about the respiratory, digestive, circular, muscular, uh, and nervous, hormonal systems, none of them exist independently of each other. It's only an abstraction that we say, uh, we've got these systems and we put them all uh, together. I think we can, this is a native human capacity. We've been denying the value to it. And again, coming back to what Rudolfo says about the arts uh, and STEAM, uh, to, to bring together that integrated perceptions of reality, which are real to us when we make decisions. Shall I take a job in this field or shall I move there or marry this person? We have to look at the entire reality uh, of which uh, things are made. The third kind of separation, and I'm simplifying, 
great development of science, we have tried to so much secularize ourselves and be objective. We've taken ourselves away from the humanity that makes us who we are. And our discussions in the academy over the years, looking at the social sciences, the most, uh, the most statistically measurable of the social sciences, economics. We have found time and again that by neglecting the subjective dimension of reality, you get an abstract reality that is unconnected with the world we live in. Why in 2008, in a matter of weeks, $10 trillion of wealth in the world disappeared, nothing happened <laughs> except perceptions changed. So if, if, our, if, our, if our social sciences lose touch with the subjective reality on which all our living is based, we are not, Newton we're not living in a Newtonian world. We're living in a human-centered world where we're creating the rules, the laws, and as has been said, the values. And the idea of sanitizing our knowledge from values, I think the, the founders of the academy were really saying, we've got to put back values back at the center because nothing makes any sense. There's no meaning in economics if you're just measuring GDP, <laughs> if you're just measuring productivity. The only possible meaning it has to human beings is what does that impact on us, on our welfare and our well-being? And the final comment I'd like to make, and I, I think Ulaka very perceptibly uh, addressed it in her opening remarks about creativity. One of the things that struck me about our way of knowing and our concept of knowledge is so much taken from the Newtonian world, which is natural. We understand why that happened and we learned a lot that way, but we've left out the single most important significant fact of human existence. Even in our social sciences, I would say even in psychology, which is my own field of study, we've left out the individual. We've left out the uniqueness of the individual. The unique individual doesn't exist in pure physical world. We've got quarks, mesons, protons, neutrons, and so many other types of things. But the, the uniqueness of the individual that finally leads to the ultimate conclusion and experience that one person can change the world. That doesn't fit into any econometric formulas. <laughs> Whether that person is a Steve Jobs or a Greta Thunberg or a Mahatma Gandhi or uh, we have, or, Martin Luther King are a, a positive or a negative. Uh, we need a, a way of knowing to take, and the most important is that, the most important thing we have to learn in our education is about ourselves, <laughs> about our power as an individual to change, if not the world, our world, and craft it and not just be a type. And, but our education, essentially conditions us to fit into some of the pipes, part of the holes, fit in somewhere and seek the security of that, moving away from our own creativity. So again, I just wanted to thank you because you've touched on so many key issues. We have to pursue these, I hope you agree. And we have to go further, as you have said, in finding out how do we bring this into education, not just at the higher level, I think that's way too late, from the lowest levels of education up, because children maybe are much more receptive to this than when we are when we've already been conditioned. So thanks again. Thank you very much, uh, Gary. Thank you to uh, my president. It, it was uh, for conclusion, a few words. It was a great pleasure to listen to you. Uh, and I hope uh, we will uh, soon have other opportunities to share ideas and uh, project. And we brought together knowledge and skills, but above all, uh, we brought people together, albeit in a mediated way. Thank you all for contribution, for your contribution and generosity. See you soon and good conference. Thank you very much.